The conflict perspective is it's got two uh, forefathers, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels. Marx gets a very bad rap in the United States um, because he was the father of communism. But when you look at him sociologically and you think about him as an academic, he actually wanted to help people. He thought that um, people were being stepped upon, and poor people predominantly. His heart was in a good place. He saw rich people as dangerous, rich people as looking out for themselves, and he wanted people to think about that. So he did think that a better society for all could emerge peacefully. Similarly, Engels, um, Engels wrote about things like patriarchy and the dominance of men. Um, they worked together, and they were the forefathers of conflict approach. This other image that we have here is a woman named Patricia Hill Collins. Uh, she is currently the president of the American Sociological Association. Um, she taught at the school that I attended for my um, master's and Ph.D., uh, her name is Patricia Hill Collins. Uh, she's a black feminist theorist. She looks at the intersection of basically poverty, race, and um, gender. And she looks at, you know, who's getting stepped on. She's sort of reinventing the conflict approach in a more modern context. Let's talk about the assumption of, assumptions of the conflict approach. What do they see as the real essence of society? Well, first we have competition. Competition over scarce resources is at the heart of all social re relationships. The conflict theorists think that we compete. We're not working together harmoniously like an organism. We are competing. I want a job. You want a job. I want to date that, that woman. You want to date that woman. I want a new car. You want a new car. I want to buy a car. They want to get the highest price. I want to get the lowest price. Competition, competition. They see it everywhere. They don't see harmony, they see competition. Inequality. <clears throat> a lot of people refer to this as the haves and the have-nots. The haves have money, the haves have power, the have-nots do not have money and power. Inequality and power and reward are built into all institutions. Individuals and groups that benefit from any particular institution and inequality strive to maintain it. Well, Actually, this should seem a lot more obvious than it is. Inequality is everywhere. Think about our families. Father and mother over children. Think about our education system. Teacher over student. Our workplaces, bosses over workers. Inequality is built into the system. Not equality, inequality. Take it a step further. There is inequality, and anyone who's on top of the game wants to stay on top of the game. So the teacher will not allow anything that disrupts their power. If I'm lecturing and I have a student talking in class, you bet your ass I'm going to tell that student to shut up. <laughs> because it takes away from my sort of power within the system. And if teachers let students just talk and talk and talk during class, that doesn't work for the teacher. So people who benefit from systems strive to maintain their benefits. That's huge. And a lot of people miss this. When we're looking at all sorts of topics we're going to talk about this semester, keep this one in mind. How are people maintaining their benefits, the people that do benefit? Last assumption, social change. The functional approach says that bad things are left behind and good things are adapted. Well, the conflict approach says that sounds rather nonviolent it sounds rather, you know, simple and natural. Good things are accepted. Bad things are dropped. Conflict approach says, no way. The have-nots, the poor people, the workers, the unions, the women, the homosexuals, the disabled, um, they fight. And they fight. And they make demands. And it's a hard, long process of conflict, of competing interests. In many cases, reform occurs, but fundamental aspects of inequality continue. Okay? I want to make a couple of disclaimers about the conflict approach. The conflict approach isn't saying that these things are good. They're saying that these are their assumptions about the way the world works, and they want to change the foundational assumptions about the world. They do not like competition and inequality. 
The conflict approach advocates on behalf of the poor, the minority, the women, the less than. And the conflict approach wants to end the inequality. So please, 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 when you're doing your work, when you're writing your midterm, when you're discussing things with your classmates, please don't let me see you saying that the conflict approach likes competition and likes inequality and wants to create more competition and inequality. That's not the case. Okay, I drew you a picture for the structural functional approach. Here's our picture for the conflict approach. We don't have circles. We are not talking about overlapping circles that show, you know, community and, and togetherness and boundaries. Instead, I used arrows. The big fat arrows symbolize groups with lots of power. The little skitty thin arrows symbolize groups with very little power. They're pushing against each other. The social change is occurring, but not naturally in an adaptive evolutionary process. It occurs through that conflict that we're seeing. The arrows are pushing against each other to symbolize that conflict. And again, I chose arrows because to me, arrows pushing against each other symbolize that competition and conflict. Any questions? Oh, that's rhetorical. Okay. Another common error that we see, a lot of people think the conflict approach approves of inequality and competition. That is not true. The second error that people make is that when I say competition, they'll start talking about Coke and Pepsi or um, the Republican and the Democratic parties. That's wrong. Coke and Pepsi are not competing. They make it appear like they're competing, but they're not. Coke and Pepsi both sell sugar water. I do have a small problem drinking the sugar water myself because I really love caffeine. I'm a caffeine junkie. But I realize that these are horrible, evil corporations. <laughs> and um, they both have an interest in selling us sugar water. That's very bad for us. They're in bed together. If Americans start thinking that Coke and Pepsi is unhealthy and they should stop drinking it, Coke and Pepsi lose, okay? So the amount of competition we're seeing about between Coke and Pepsi is not that competitive. Their prices are about the same. They split up the world 50-50 between Coke and Pepsi. This is a, you know, is it a Pepsi campus? Is it a Coke campus? Is this a, a sports complex, a Coke uh, complex, or a Pepsi complex? And uh, they're not really competing. It's kind of like the Cold War. Now, if we look at the Democrat and Republican Party, again, that's not the form of competition we're talking about. The conflict approach wants to talk about sort of the, the more stark competition. So please, please keep that in mind. A lot of people, they'll start saying, I want to apply, apply the conflict approach to uh, you know, Obama and the Republicans. And you could do it. Yes, you could. It's possible. But for the purposes of this class, let's push it to its limits. Let's look at the forms of competition that are really envisioned when we talk about competition. We're talking about the homeless man and the millionaire, the rich and the poor. We're talking about police brutality. Um, we're talking about driving while black. We're talking about discrimination and racism. We're talking about gender discrimination, sexual harassment, the glass ceiling, if you've heard that term before. These are the forms of competition and inequality that we'll be focusing on this semester, not um, the Coke and Pepsis of the world. Okay, the deeper understanding of the conflict approach. The conflict approach says that human nature is not the problem. Um, parents long ago gave birth to their children, and they knew that they were supposed to take care of them. They might not have treated them like the little bundles of joy that we treat them today, but parents realized that you take care of your kids. Human nature is not the problem. The problem is that the world is unequal. The world has become unequal, where we have rich people and poor people. We have people who have power. Those people use social organizations, institutions, and culture to maintain their power. <laughs> and, and they make the world act in socially destructive ways. So for the conflict approach, what we need is to change our social organization institutions to make those things better for our society.
human nature is not the, the problem for these folks. Um, humans, you know, if you look at it in a religious context, some people who are religious would say man was made by God and there's nothing wrong with human. There's nothing wrong with humans. Other people would say, you know, there is a sort of an original sin idea. The conflict approach is on the side of there's nothing wrong with man. We're fine. Human nature is not the problem. Later in the semester, we'll talk about human nature and whether it exists at all. Okay, what questions does the conflict perspective ask about the world? If you compare them to the functional approach, which I hope you're able to do, it's the same set of questions. It's slightly different. So, first question is the same. What are the social structures involved? What patterns exist? What cultural meanings are involved? Here's where they change. Who benefits from these structures and cultural meanings? In Latin, I believe the phrase is quo bono. I think that's what it is. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's quo bono. Who benefits? The second question is, how do those people maintain their advantages? So it's the same questions. What are the social structures? What are the, the relationships involved? What are the social relationships involved? What are the cultural meanings involved? And who's benefiting, and how do they maintain those benefits? If you ask these questions every time you try to apply it, um, you should do OK. Or at least you're trying to use the tools, which I like. OK. What concepts or tools does the conflict perspective use? Um, first one, resource. Anything valued in society. If you think about this, the conflict approach is saying that our society is unequal. Well, what are they unequal, unequal in terms of? Resources. <laughs> so resources is a central component. Resources can be money. It can be jobs. It could be happiness. It could be the ability to have voice. It could be... Um, the ability to um, get something on television, the ability to put something on the internet, whatever it is, it's a resource. Second tool, collective interests. The conflict approach is about groups. The functional approach is about the good of the whole, society as a whole, thinking about you know, society in terms of its whole. The conflict approach does not see the good of the whole. They see competing groups. So what goes along with that is collective interest. What concerns the group and what is best for the group? I have an example of this that I'd like to give. I'll probably say it a couple times this semester. Well, let's analyze the collective interest of workers. Ideally, I want to work, I would say I probably want to work 20 hours a week. I want to be paid I could probably live on 100000 I'm not trying to be greedy or anything. I could live on 100000 That would be nice. So 20 hours a week, $100,000 a year. I'm not being greedy, right? Now, my boss. My boss would love it if I would work 80 hours a week and pay me $20,000 a year. Those are the boss's collective interests. All of us want to work as little as possible and get paid as much as possible. And from the, the employer perspective, they want you to work as much as possible and pay you as little as possible. That's how you analyze collective interest. You're saying what's best for them. That's a little bit of a simplification, but we can talk about it next week when we talk about stratification. Now, the conflict approach would point out that this is about resources. It's about time and money. Who controls that time? Who controls that money? Well, employers decide how much time you work whether it's full-time, whether it's part-time, and they decide how much you get paid. So that resource is controlled by somebody, and we have different collective interests over it. Next tool, institutions. Now, the functionalists said institutions were made to, to meet human need. The conflict approach say that institutions create, maintain, and hide inequality. Very, very different understandings. Think about this. One perspective says institutions are made to meet human need. The other one says institutions create, maintain, and hide inequality. Examples of institutions are schools, government, police, family, and religion. Each one of these institutions is creating inequality, maintaining it, and hiding it. What we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you to watch a clip of a, of a movie called The Prize Winner. And I told you how the structural functional approach would define institutional interdependence.